during these uh, six or seven weeks that I've been down, and uh, I'm feeling a lot better. I don't have much strength yet. Still working on low hemoglobin that carries the oxygen to my muscles, but we're doing real well. But I do appreciate each and every prayer, each and every card, each and every letter. I read all of everything I got, and I'm grateful for that. Let's stand and uh, say our statements of faith, please. There's a copy there in front of you, probably in the pew, if you don't have one. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe the three are one. We are the church, and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the whole Christian that Christ one day will return to earth. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful this morning that we can come together in this place, blend our voices in praise unto Thee, to look to Thee as the author and finisher of our faith. We're so grateful for the gift of Jesus given by You, Your only Son, to come and suffer, bleed, and die for us. This morning we would ask you, Lord, above all else, to just lead God and direct us in the way to be pleasing unto you. We surrender our lives to you this morning, Lord, to do your will according to your word. We ask you now for the forgiveness of our sins and our shortcomings in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I pray soft and low, when I pray this I know, God will always hear, God will always hear, amen. Douglas? Short all of a sudden. Morning. In the spirit of of uh, of you, I sat down the other day when I. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to all those visiting with us today. We are glad to have you. Always, always <laughs> welcome. Okay, I'll stand up. No, I was just clapping investors were here. Huh? I was clapping investors were here. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is so good to see this man back Amen. today. Amen. Okay. So good to see him back today. If you look on the left hand side of your bulletin. I'm assuming you're going to still be preaching out of the greatest words ever spoken. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, good. Six o'clock tonight back in the fellowship hall. Encourage all to come be a part of that. Um, we, uh, we see the power of prayer sitting on the front row this morning. Okay. It was, uh, I don't think in all my years I've ever seen him miss. What was it, three weeks? Four. Four weeks in a row, ever. He missed one when he had to have surgery. <laughs> yeah, he had heart surgery. He only missed one week. So, uh, but uh, we are so glad to have you back today. God is good. Okay. Yeah, so, um, there's not a whole lot looking like on announcements this morning. Is there anything I need to make everybody aware of? December business meeting will be tonight. Y'all are either a little uh, late or a lot early. We haven't had the, the December, and, and now it's almost time for January, but we'll do December, and then Wednesday we'll do January. Amen. Right. Which will then be into February. And so we'll be on time. Okay. <laughs> business meeting tonight at 6 o'clock, and then Dad will speak after that. Okay? Uh... Let's do something this week. Let's, every day this week, invite one person Amen. to come next Sunday. Amen. Just one. 
every day this week, the worst thing they can do is say no. But even if they do, you have planted the seed in their mind that I need to go to church Amen. or that somebody cared enough to invite me to church. Okay? One person a week or what? One person a day for the next week. Sound good? Amen. Deal? Amen. Okay. Let's all take our hymnals now. If you feel like standing fine, turn to the pastor's favorite song, number 441. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And a black soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul Like a sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I'm possessed of a hope Steadfast and sure Since Jesus came into my heart And no dark clouds of doubt Pathway obscure Since Jesus came into my heart Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul Like a sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell In that city I know Since Jesus came into my heart and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul Like a sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart my heart. Amen. You may be seated. Turn over now your hymnals, number 546. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus who faithfully saves. He your Savior, wider than out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. 
be your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me. could help love Amen. For the offertory hymn this morning, it's uh, stand and turn to number 444. shades of night till Jesus came to me with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee sunlight sunlight in my soul today sunlight sunlight all along the way since the Savior found me took away my sin I have had the sunlight of his love with me Though clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll, however dark the world may be, sunlight in my soul, sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way, since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of His love within. Soon I shall see him as he is the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his faith throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior sound me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love with him. Let's join together in the spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the privilege and honor of being able to gather together to worship you freely. We pray for those that are not with us here today, be it sickness or other circumstances. We pray, Lord, that you will take this offering today, that you will multiply it, send it out to do the good work. We pray that you will bring us back safely here tonight, next Sunday. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I tell y'all what, I heard our visitor singing back there, and I think she ought to be up here singing. <laughs> yeah, that's great. We're sure glad to have y'all with us today, all of you. That's wonderful. I tell you, it's been a few weeks. Uh, we've uh, went through COVID, the toll charge had it, and now we're over it. Uh, we went through. Um, give you enough line. Oh, that's all right. You give me too much rope, I'll hang myself. <laughs> uh, we've we've had our pastor out for a long time, and I just tell you, when you when your leader is absent, you can't. I don't know about y'all, but I found myself wondering which path to take. Sometimes, I mean, I, the Holy Spirit tells me where to go, but He tells me how to get there. <laughs> so I'm just glad to see him back. And Patsy and Corny, it's good to see y'all back and well and healthy. James and Pauline. I'll love you, Steve. 
everybody we, we just sue it's always good to see you you, you kind of staple you're like flour in a cake batter you know you hold it all together <laughs> what are you doing douglas oh well i'm gonna sing now <laughs> Y'all, I'm not a I'm not a singer, but I'm gonna tell you what my heart's full of the Lord. Uh, I, I remember when I didn't have Him, and if you ever forget that, you're in trouble. Amen. You're in trouble. So all those bad memories—they're not bad memories; they're life's lessons. So don't don't ever don't ever forget them. Don't ever forget them. We don't have to pay for them after they're paid for, and Jesus did that. And as long as we accept that, we're done. You know, we're we're in we're in the door. But but I'll never forget how I felt. If I just don't ever want to forget that lost feeling, you know, because then the saved feeling is so much greater. You know, it's just so much greater. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. My voice ain't very good today, but my husband told me to do it. So you know, he's the boss at my house. <laughs> when I let him. Like the woman at the well I was seeking For things that could not satisfy And then I heard my Savior speaking Draw from my well that never shall run dry Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, oh, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are seeking For pleasures earthly goods afford Oh, but none can match the wondrous treasure That I found in Jesus Christ, my Lord Y'all sing it so fill my cup, Lord, or oh, lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, oh, feed me till I want no more. Fill my this world gives you leave hunger that just won't pass away oh my blessed lord will come and save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray fill my cup lord all we lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Bread of heaven, I'll fill us till we want no more. Fill our cup, fill it up, and make us whole. ahead of myself but I can't say that enough <laughs> we're gonna sing it three times <laughs>
this morning silent prayer that we will fill this house to overflowing before this year is over. Good morning, everyone. The last time I was with you here in the house of the Lord was the 12th day of December. And uh, I got sick that night and uh, continued to be sick for several weeks. I've been in the hospital 10 days. I don't recommend that. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, I got good care. Uh, it took them a long time to figure out what was wrong with me. Good. Uh, huh. I'm good. Actually, sure. I'd like it a little closer, but I couldn't get it to roll. Thank you. There we go. Okay. That's the first step of assisted living. <laughs> uh, this morning, I'd like to ask you to take your Bible and join me in the book of Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Now, we're not going to read all of that. I just want to have a starting point for us to understand the story. This morning, I'm going to talk and speak with you from God's Word about one of the most dangerous sins that we can become involved in. It's called ego. Amen. Ego. We know when we read our Bibles this morning that... Uh, Ego had a prominent place in why God had to throw Satan out of heaven. He said, I'm as good as God. I need to be God. I'm better looking. He was the most beautiful angel God had ever created. And he got absorbed with that. That leads me to think there must have been a mirror somewhere in heaven. Or maybe he looked over into the crystal sea and saw his reflection. But the problem that he had was he thought he needed to be God. Today in our world, when ego overtakes us, it's really what we call a demigod type of possession. You know, when we think we're better than other people or we're smarter than other people. And so our ego is a very, very dangerous thing for us. Let's take a few moments to read in the beginning of chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Cana. Now, we find here, it says, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpath, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father an evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was a son of his old age. He made him a coat of many colors. 
The first thing we see here is the deep devotion of the father to this very last child. And he was much younger than his other brothers. They were grown at this time. And he displayed to him a very special gift. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you've got brothers, and the new one comes along, and now the new one gets all the sparkle, so to speak. And they became very jealous, okay? Why didn't Dad give us a coat of many colors? Why didn't he have one made for every one of us? Oh, no. He just did it for Joseph, okay? We discover here that one of the things that we've often talked about is the fact that when we have multiple children, we have to understand something. We're human. And we say we love all my children alike, but you don't. God's Word tells us that you can't. It's not a bad thing. It's a humanistic thing. So, it says, Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brother, and they hated him yet the more. He said unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed, that's in verse 7, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obedience to my sheaf. That's not a very good story to tell somebody. Okay? We decided we was going to go someplace, but when we got there, I stood up and all the rest of you bowed to me. This is a 17-year-old kid, you know? And immediately it said they hated him the more. They already hated him because of the distinction between that his father made with him. Sometimes people don't realize Satan can take the best of things and twist it if you're not very, very careful. Okay? Then he says in verse 9 or verse 8, His brother said to him, Thou shalt reign over us? That's a question. Or thou shalt indeed have dominion over us? We don't think so. We don't think so. They hate him yet the more for his dream and for his words. How dare him tell us that? Isn't that how we feel today? How dare him tell us that? Okay. Now in verse 90, he dreamed yet another dream and told his brethren, Behold, I have dreamed a dream and more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars are made obedience unto me. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and the father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and my mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father observed the same. Now, these guys have decided to get rid of Joseph. Y'all know the story. And so they take Joseph with them into the field to tend the sheep, and they dig a pit. And they strip him of all of his things, his clothes, and put him in the pit. They're sitting around there talking about that, you know. And uh, then they begin to think about some things. Let's look at verse 24 of that 37th chapter. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and lift up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Israelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery, balm, myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? They're going to hide the fact they've killed their, their brother. He's come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Now what's he saying? Kill him will mean put nothing in their pocket, but if we do this, we'll get something. To... So, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers were content. In verse 28 it says, They sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought him unto Egypt. Now, they take the coat of many colors. They kill a young goat and soak it in blood. They take it back to their father and here's what they say to him. You know? They say in verse 32, they sent the coat of many colors and brought it to their father and said, "We have this we have found thus now, whether it be thy sons or not. Now, they knew it belonged to his son, didn't it? See, that's one of those other things. We have ego. And the next thing we do is sliding from the truth. A little bit longer, and we're misrepresenting. This is the way ego works. Very dangerous. 
And he knew it was and said, This is my son's coat. An evil be beast has devoured Joseph and is without doubt rent in two. He said, Well, if my son's been killed by an evil beast. Now, I want you to turn over a few pages with me. If you would, please. To verse 39. Joseph went down, was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down hither. The Lord was with Joseph. No, don't forget that verse. The Lord was with Joseph. Let me tell you something this morning. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Lord is with you. Amen. You can never do anything without His knowledge or without His presence. I guess one of the most frightening things we have to deal with is the fact, according to Scripture, wherever we go, 24 hours a day, if we're a believer, we take Jesus with us. Amen. Okay? A few years ago, a popular little wristband a lot of people wore said, What would Jesus do? Okay? Well, there's a better wristband than that. I'm with you always. I'm with you always. We can't go any place without Jesus. I don't care where you go. You're not separated from Jesus. So if we're not separated from Jesus, okay, then whatever we do involves Jesus. And it becomes a stench in his life, you know. The Bible said on our best day, we don't even smell good to God. Can you imagine what it's like when we're not in act of sin? So, here in this uh, 39th chapter, the Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. Now, the Bible said he was prosperous. He was a slave that just got sold. Most people say a slave is not very prosperous. He was prosperous. His prosperity was inside him with his relationship with the Lord. Amen. Our prosperity today is the very same way. Many times you've heard me say to you through the years, our God is as large in our life as we allow Him to be or as small as we make Him. You see? I talked to a man one time and he said, well, I've been out of church a long time. I said, I haven't walked with the Lord in a long time. I said, no, you've walked with the Lord every day. Amen. You just hadn't thought of realizing the fact He was still with you. What does God say when we come here by faith in Jesus Christ? I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So you may walk away from God today. But if you've walked away, you can always come back. Because you come back with Him. When you walk away, He's there with you. When you start back, He's there with you. We cannot separate ourselves from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go down to verse 4 or verse 3. The Master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph found grace in the sight of Potiphar. He served him and made him overseer of all of his house, and all that he put had he put into his hands. Now, go down to verse 7 because of time. Okay? It came to pass after these things that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said to Joseph, Come to bed with me. Okay? But he refused. He refused because he knew God wouldn't bless that. He refused because he knew that was wrong. He knew that was something he did not have control over. Now, I want you to go down just a little further with me there. Verse 8. He refused and said unto the master's wife, Behold, my master willeth not what is with me in this house, and he hath committed all that he has into my hand. There is none greater than the house that I am. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but you. You. Everything else was under his control. Then he says, Because thou art his wife, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It's something we don't often think about. Every sin we sin is against God. Amen. And we need to realize that. If we go out and rob somebody, We've sinned against God. If we go out and take something that's not ours, we sin against God. If we step across what God's told us to do, we sin against God. This is the problem. Now, we're going to discover here, go down to verse 20 of chapter 39. 
Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. Now, if you learn nothing else this morning, as a believer, you need to know this. When you leave this service, and throughout all the rest of your days as a believer, God will never leave you. Amen. God will never leave you. And so he was put in prison, and he was bound, but verse 21 says the Lord was with Joseph. He showed him mercy, gave him favor, and the sight of the keeper of the prison, and pretty soon he's run into prison. Now, verse 23 of verse chapter 39 says, The keeper of the prison looked to not anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord bade it to prosper. Everything Joseph touched turned to prosperity. See? Now you say, wait a minute. How can this be God? His brothers lie that, they, that he's been killed by a beast and sell him into slavery. He arrives in Egypt. He's bought by an officer of the court and put in charge of his house. He's falsely accused by the wife. He goes to prison. He's there 12 years. And he didn't do anything. He fled from the sin. A lot of times people don't realize something. Many times sin is something that happens when you get too close. And he fled from it. And when he was questioned, he, did, he defended himself, said, I did nothing. She said he did, but he didn't. He gets 12 years in prison. He's in the prison not very long until suddenly the word of how he had run Potiphar's house comes to the prison warden. And so he puts him in charge. And the prison begins to prosper. He probably got everything under control, the budget, and he got this done. All these things because God was with him. Okay. Now let's go to chapter uh, 41, please. We'll go to verse 25. Joseph said unto Pharaoh... The Pharaoh, Pharaoh's had a dream, and he don't know nothing about it. He says, what am I going to do? And they said, well, they, Joseph's is in prison, but he knows all about these things. So they bring him from the prison and into the presence of Pharaoh. And uh, Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of the Pharaoh is one. God showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now remember something. God has a plan for your life. Amen. And God expects us to accept that plan and to move forward with it. And so he said, Pharaoh, I know about your dream, but the most important thing is God is showing you what he is about to do. Then he tells him about this dream. Seven good kind or seven years, and the seven good years of corn that you saw are seven great years, and the dream is one. You're going to have seven years of great prosperity. And the king, Pharaoh, said, well, that sounds good. Then Joseph continues. And the, in verse 27, the seven thin and ill-favored years that came up before after them, or seven years and the seven empty years, those empty corn years, blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he shows to Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of great famine. Now, I want to speak to you ladies for just a moment, if I may. How many of y'all, I want you to raise your hand, have gone to the grocery store looking for something you've all been bought, buying for years and couldn't find it? Yeah. We're kind of in famine, aren't we? You know? I told Annabelle the other day, I said, I don't understand shortage in the grocery store when I know the cattlemen are still raising cattle and I know the guys are still selling hogs and I know they're still working on chickens and all this. Why are we without? Because it's part of a plan. Amen. It's part of God's plan. Amen. See? Now, we haven't missed meals. We've just had to eat something else, <laughs> you know. And uh, the other morning, I even had some oatmeal. I'm not a terrible fan of oatmeal, but it wasn't bad, you know. But we're having to change a few things. 
But remember, God is going to show the way. Remember, God is in control. Remember, God knows what he's doing. Amen. And the way we know what we're doing is to follow what God is doing. Now, then we discover something. So Pharaoh says in verse 38 of the 41st chapter of the book of Genesis, Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, that is, can we find one such as this is, a man in whom, and it's capitalized, the Holy Spirit of God is. He's not a believer. He's an atheist. He worships the ten gods of Egypt. And he worked on that every day. But he said, this guy's different. Okay? This is what we have to teach our world today. Amen. The Christian is different. Now, we don't look different on the outside. And the Bible says man looks on the outer appearance. God looks upon the heart. Okay? But you are different. Amen. You have a mission. You have a life to be lived that honors and uplifts the Lord. Do you, how do you much do you think that of all the good things that Joseph had already did and that they already knew about, all of that coming together for one thing? The famine is not just in Egypt. It's all over that part of the country. Okay? His brothers decide at their father's urging to go into Egypt and buy grain that they needed to survive on. Okay? And when they get there, they don't recognize Joseph. They get the grain. They come back. They talk about the family. And Joseph says, where's this little one you talk about? Well, he's back with father. Is he back with father? No. He's droped in the robe of, a, of the Pharaoh of Egypt. They don't know that, you know. Yeah. Now, I want you to look at chapter 42, verse 8. Joseph knew his brother, but they knew him not. He recognized them. One of the last things he saw as he was chained and let off as a slave was to look back and see those boys who had pulled him out of that pit. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed of and said, Yet you are spies. To see the nakedness of the land you are come. But now the said unto him, Nay, my Lord, to buy food are the servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men and thy servants are not spies. He said to them, Nay, but see the nakedness of the land you've come. They said, Thy servants are twelve brothers, sons of one man of Cana. Behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and he one is not. What's happened? Another boy's been born. Okay. But the father hadn't forgot Joseph. He mourned for months and months and months. He was focused. Go to verse 21, please, 42. They said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Break the law of God, you've got to pay a penalty. Amen. It doesn't always come here. A lot of times we do. I've often thought and I've often mentioned in messages, if uh, God took care of our sins of the week and paid off on every Friday night, our lives would be different, wouldn't they? Amen. Yeah. We pay attention. Yeah, we begin to pay attention. We don't pay a whole lot of attention to God now. You know? So, these guys realize what they've done. They know the price that's been paid. To shorten the story for time factor, they're sent to bring back this other young child. He said, when you come again, bring the little one. Because Joseph hadn't seen him. And when they come back, he gives them grain again. When you go home today, read the rest of that story the next few chapters. Just take you a few minutes. And you'll find astonishments as to what is going to happen. Now, let's turn over a little bit further. Let's go to the 44th chapter, please. Actually, chapter 45. Verse 5 says, verse 4, Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Wow, what an announcement. I can see them now. 
they would begin to shake in their sandals, wouldn't they? I'm Joseph, who put in a pit and sold as a slave. And now I'm the most powerful man in Egypt. And your life depends upon what I say. All of a sudden, their egos are drained away. Reality sets in. He's going to kill us. But he's not. He's not. Then it says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Amen. Okay? These two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years remaining in which thou shalt neither be ear earing nor harvest. No grains, of, no corn, no harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Now, each morning when you get up, I'm going to try to go back to the office in the morning for a few hours. I haven't been there since um, 12, 10, 11, since the 9th of December. But when I'm going to go in there with the intention of accomplishment. I'm going to go in there with the intention of catching up my records. I'm going to go in there with the intention of getting all the things I need back in place that I take care of at the business uh, each day. But I don't know how that's going to go just yet. I told my owner the other day, I said, I'm going to try to come and make the morning. If I feel good, I'll play the afternoon. If I feel like I think I'll feel, I may go home. He said, that's fine. Do what you need to do. Very gracious for me about that. Now, go down to verse 11, chapter 45. There will I, Joseph, nourish you, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. God, what you meant, did to me, God meant it for good. Amen. See, we don't know about that. The circumstances of our lives change every day. And sometimes we say, oh, woe is me. Before you do that next time, ask yourself this question. I wonder what God is fixing to do in my life. I wonder what, how God's going to use me. I wonder what God's going to set before me that I can do and perform and meet his will. Now, I want you to look at the book of Nehemiah's prophecy. I want to go to chapter 4. Eight. We'll pick up in verse 8 of that chapter. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave sense and caused them to understand the reading. You know, every time you open up your Bible, before you begin, you should ask God for understanding. Lord, help me to understand this passage as you would have it apply to me today. Okay? If you go down to verse 10, it says, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. You've got to learn to share. For this day is holy unto the Lord our God. Neither be you sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And as a believer this morning, if you don't take that verse to heart, you're missing a lot of, of the message. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Okay. When Christ died upon the cross, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, he suffered, bled, and died to pay our price before God. It's the price of our sins. God will accept only one thing to pay for your sins. The blood of Jesus. But you have to believe in Him to have that experience. See? There's nothing like the blood of Jesus. It cleanses the most vile of all sinners. Many people say, well, I've had to say, well, Brother Doug, I've never done anything really bad in my life. Okay? And my answer to that, well, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Well, I haven't got that done, but that's not something bad. That'd be something good. I've, I've, I've done good things. And they probably have. Let me tell you something. The jacket I'm wearing is black. Right here. Our sins are black before God. Before we get too far, let's acknowledge the fact that there's no such thing as a white lie. I hear people say it all the day. Well, last week I told a little white lie. Lies are not white, they're black because they're sinful. 
The truth must be accepted by us before God and acted upon before God. So he says to this, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now if you go to chapter 9, verse 6, same Nehemiah, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. There's no one like our Lord. Thou hast made the heavens and the heaven of heavens with all their host in the earth and all the things that are in the sea and all that is therein, and thou hast preserved them all and the host of heaven worship thee. He's creator and the majesty of Almighty. Now, thou art the Lord God who did choose Abram and brought him forth out of the year of the Chaldees and gave him the name of Abraham. Thou found his heart faithful before thee and made a covenant with Abram to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Gershurites, to give it. I say to his seed, Thou hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. This and this see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard us their cry by the Red Sea. God's people were in Egyptian bondage 412 years. Every day they prayed for one thing. Send us a deliverer. We want to go home. Well, according to Scripture this morning, it takes them 2,500 years to get a home again. In May 1948, United Nations conferred the fact that Israel would become a nation again and gave them the land in which they live today. That's 2,500 years. That's a long time, isn't it? See, most of us get upset with God if we pray on Monday and don't get something by Tuesday. You know? I ask God for such and such, and it's been two days. What's going on? Well, you've got to remember something. God answers prayer in one of three ways. He may give you what you want, but He's most likely going to give you what you need, and He's going to do it on His timetable. Amen. And I don't want to surprise anybody today, but God's timetable is not like our timetable. You know, it's not. We have no indication he ever sleeps. We have no ind indication there's ever a time when you can't reach him by prayer. Now you go to the telephone, you call dial a prayer, you may get a busy signal. You won't get that with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See? When you call upon him in prayer, folks, he'll be there. And he will listen. And he'll send that answer. And then the third one may be the answer of waiting. I don't like the third one. Do y'all like the third one? No. But it's necessary. How would Joseph have known when they put him in the pit that he'd be the leader of Egypt? How did he know when he was sold to the Israelites, the slave traders that sold him in Egypt? How did he know then that he could save all of his people, his family, down the road? See, we don't know what's down the road, okay? We don't know. It's kind of like the two men. That, there's a Baptist church on one side of the road and a Methodist church on the other side of the road. The pastor's a real good pastor, good friends. And, and they each went and put out a great big sign in the front of their church, it said, and they stood by that sign. He said, you need to stop and trust the Lord down. Well, of course, the cars just zip by, zip by, zip by. And finally, one of them said, I, maybe we need to change our sign. And the guy said, well, what are we going to put on it? Bridge out ahead. See? See, sometimes we don't think there's anything out there, but you can be helped by just listening to what God says. Amen. Now, look at verse 12 of, of the ninth chapter of Nehemiah. More were thou leadest them in that day by a cloudy pillar, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light in the way wherein they should go. See? Once they've come across that Red Sea that, by the way, God dried the seabed. Do y'all know how long that would take under normal conditions? Uh -huh. Even when we, Remember when we pumped out the Waterloo Lake over here? It was months and months and months and months and months before you could walk out there because it was so deep in, in the wet silt. God just dried it just like that. Just like that. Okay? And they came across. Wagons and carts and stock and flocks and herds and about two million people. When they got on the other side, God said, got a new program. Today, 
You don't move till the cloud moves. And tonight there will be a pillar of fire. Let you know I'm still there, I'm still there, and I'm still watching. Okay? That is important for us tonight to understand that. Now I want you to take your Bible and go to our New Testament for just a moment as we close. Got just a few moments. I want you to go to the book of Mark, chapter 14. And we're going to begin in verse 22. Now, the Bible says, I'll back up to 21. The Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. That's Judas. Good it were for that man if he had never been born. Okay. Now, they're eating the Last Supper. Verse 22. As they did eat, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take it, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the New Testament. Now, why does he say New Testament? The old law is fixing to go away. Okay? Amen. And we're going to have a New Testament. A New Testament is the blood of Christ and grace. He said to them, This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. That's each one who will believe. Verily I say unto you, I will not drink no more the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it in the new kingdom of God. That'll be heaven. When they had sung a song, they went out unto the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, All of you shall be offended because of me this night. Now, that projection of what's going to happen later has become timely. Tonight, he says, you will be challenged because of me. So then Jesus says, And they went into the Mount of Olives. He said, All of you shall be offended because of me this night in verse 27, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. After I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. That's a really important verse. After I am risen, I'll meet you in Galilee. Now, we know what? After the crucifixion, after the tomb is sealed, after they find the tomb open, and the women report their body is gone, and they go back to tell the disciples, they beat on the door, let us in. We have a great message. They said, Christ is gone. And they said, well, perhaps he was stolen away. They didn't remember this little verse over here, verse 28. I will rise again, and I'll meet you in Galilee. Outside the tomb, there was not one disciple sitting waiting for his resurrection. Not a one. None of them showed up on that morning later to see what was happening until they ran to the sepulcher and entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And then it took what? It took an ain't two angels to tell these women, to tell these disciples, you'll find him in Galilee just like he said. Amen. Now everything the Lord Jesus Christ has ever told us will be just like he said. Amen. Okay? So we discover something. I want you to look over in Luke chapter 22. That'll be our last scriptural reference this morning. And we're going to discover here in this passage. Once, I'm going to begin in uh, verse 18 of the 22nd chapter. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And then he took the bread, and we, we know that story. Verse 22, truly the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, goeth as it was determined. Y'all know when it was determined? Before creation. Amen. Before God ever made the universe. Before He had stretched out the Milky Way. Before He ever threw out the stars. It was all done. You know something else? He knew where you'd be sitting this morning. Amen. And you're not even here yet. You're thousands of years away. But He knew right where you were going to be. See? He knew where I was going to be in the bed. He knew where I was going to be in the hospital. He knew where I was going to be... He knows all of that. And you're not even here yet. 
Remember he said to the prophet Isaiah, I knew you before you were ever in your mother's womb. Mom and dad didn't even know each other, but I knew they would come to you. I knew what you'd be doing because that's the way God is. And that applies to each one of us. Amber and I were talking last night. I said, the beautiful thing about the Bible is, says God's no respecter of person. He knows as much about one of us as he knows another. And not only does he know he to know today, he knows tomorrow. See? So why would we trust anything but him? Amen. Okay? You can't go out and buy a map today that'll tell you where you're going to be tomorrow. God already knows where you're going to be tomorrow. And so that's important. Now look at verse 69. This is what he tells these disciples. In verse 69 of Luke 22. Hereafter, that's beyond this day, shall the Son of Man, that's Jesus our Lord, sit on the right hand of the power of God. And that's where he's sitting this morning. And every time I pray and you pray in Jesus' name, he hears Amen. and responds in one of those three ways I told you. I want to close this morning by sharing with you this. So many times... We fail to understand our daily condition. I apologize. I said last reference. I got one more and I will be through. Break on, brother. Acts uh, chapter 7, verse 51. Stephen is with a group of people and he's preaching the story of Jesus. And here's what he says in that 51st first verse. Ye, the, the crowd, are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ears. Your ears are covered. Your heart is covered and you're stiff-necked, you won't humble yourself before God. You do always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, that's Jesus Christ, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels, and have not kept it. So what does God expect us to do? He expects us to Listen to Jesus, trust Jesus, become obedient to Jesus, let our wives be directed by the Word of God. In this book, you will always find how much God loves you. Amen. If He didn't love us, He wouldn't look after us. If He didn't love Joseph, He wouldn't have protected him. He wouldn't have blessed him. And we have to realize this morning our humility of humbling ourselves before the Lord is the most important thing we can do. Amen. You know? And so we trust Jesus as our Savior. And we do that by saying, you know more than I know. Amen. Okay? I'll be obedient to you. The greatest word for the Christian, once they've trusted Christ as Savior, is obedience. Obedience. But I can't be obedient for you, and you can't be obedient for me. We all must choose our own obedience. Amen. And we do that by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Living as He asks us to live. Leaving ego out of our life. Not thinking we're better than we are. The Bible says we are smaller in the sight of God than the fine dust of the gold dust balance. When they shake it out, there's still a little left and we're smaller than that. But we're at the essence of his heart. The Bible says our names are graven upon his hands. Okay? That's not a tattoo. That's graven. That's cut into the flesh. How can he forget you when you're right here? How can we fear when we're in the hand of the Father, secured by the hand of the Son? We trust Jesus. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus just said. Once you trust Jesus, you have an alliance with the Father. You're in the hand of Jesus, in the hand of God. And no man, no man can take you out of God's hand. Amen. But you can take yourself. You don't lose salvation. You lose service. You lose blessing. You lose reward. You lose leadership. You lose guidance if you don't listen to God. Join with us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today to be in this place and to have the joy of being back among God's people grateful for the restoration of health, grateful for the prayers of this thy congregation and many others, grateful for your mercy and your grace. Today we ask if one among us does not know Jesus, they'd trust Christ today and begin to follow him in faithful obedience. We ask this morning, Lord, that you'll bless each one before us today. 
We pray a special blessing upon those visiting with us this morning. Our hearts are always glad and excited to see others come and be here in the house of worship. Bless us now in these moments and forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. 317. For Jesus said, a sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. For Jesus said, His precious blood, rich blessings to bestow, plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Speak a word over you before you leave today. Heavenly Father, we ask that upon each one here present before us today, your powerful presence will impress upon them that you love them, that you care for them, that you provide for them through the gift of your Son. And this week, that each day, we'll walk in the expectancy of what God has in store for us. Remember, whatever comes your way, God means it for good. Stay the course. Be faithful. And let God work in your life. Everyone in this room this morning is a product of missionary work by someone. Someone prayed for you. Someone instructed you. Someone shared the word with you. Someone gave that there could be a place for a voice of coming. And we ask this morning as you go from this place that you'll rejoice in the good message and the good news and the faithfulness of our Savior Jesus Christ. In whose name we ask and pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Amen. See you tonight for Bible study.